Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. Dozens of criminal cases could be in jeopardy tonight after police evidence from three counties may have been thrown away or contaminated. And the irony is it was all a part of an effort by the Shirts Police Department to clean up. An effort that the defenders Dylan Collier finds has some prosecutors asking, now what? Neither a torrential downpour or the mess enveloping his department's evidence room could dampen New Shirts Police Chief Jim Lowry's swearing-in ceremony late last month. The longtime Arlington police officer inherits a department in the midst of investigating itself over the improper destruction of items from criminal cases. Even worse, since Schertz sits at the intersection of three counties, the foul-up could have a long reach. Guadalupe County Attorney David Wilborn discovered the problem months ago and sent Lowry's predecessor a cease and desist letter in February that claimed a decade's worth of his county's evidence was removed or destroyed without his permission. He called the practice dangerous and potentially illegal. Wilborn also demanded a full list of evidence that had been taken out without his review, but confirmed today he is still waiting for information on how many cases may have been impacted. And we're still trying to figure out exactly what was going on. Lowry says the issue spreads beyond Guadalupe County. Reviews are now underway in Comal and Bear County as well. And we have to move forward with them. So how did this happen? A source familiar with the case says this outside consultant was brought in by the Shirts Police Department to organize its property room. Despite a tagline of, let me help you get rid of the forgotten mess, it may have actually caused a larger mess for the agency. We want to make sure that every single case that is impacted is clearly known, and that's also required by law for disclosure. We need to let that know. And the head of that consulting firm offered no comment and hung up when we reached her on the telephone today. The city of Schertz has attempted to block several open records requests from us about its dealings with her firm, as well as for complaints about the work she did on behalf of the police department. For the Defenders, Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Dylan. A Texas House committee investigating the Robb Elementary shooting met today to interview witnesses, including Uvalde County Sheriff Ruben Alasco. Alasco's testimony was closed to the public and comes after a note of deposition was issued last week. The committee also announced today that they want to publicly release surveillance video from the hallway of Robb Elementary. Representative Dustin Burroughs said the committee has seen the 77 minute video. He said the Uvalde mayor and Texas DPS have all agreed to release the video, but they have been blocked from doing so by Uvalde County District Attorney Christina Mitchell Busby. This video would be of the hallway footage from the Robb Elementary School. It would contain no graphic images or depictions of violence. It would literally begin after the shooter enters the room and end before a breach of that room. We called and emailed the DA's office today and were told she would not comment on anything related to this investigation. The committee hopes to release its preliminary report soon. Meanwhile, on the south lawn of the White House today, Uvalde's only pediatrician spoke in support of the recently signed Safer Communities Act. The law signed by President Joe Biden in the aftermath of the Uvalde school massacre and Buffalo supermarket mass shooting. Dr. Roy Guerrero spoke positively about this move forward, but reminded people the Uvalde community is still healing. It's been tough being a pediatrician in a community where children do not want to return to school and parents don't want to send them there with the fear of a future attack. I see children daily with PTSD and anxiety that's now leading to depression. He goes on to say it's hard to convince the children they're safe knowing the weapons used in the Uvalde school massacre are still available. The Safer Communities Act creates tougher requirements for people under 21 wanting to purchase a weapon, denies domestic abusers to buy firearms, and allows judges to take weapons from those deemed to be dangerous. The Bear County Medical Examiner is releasing a final update on the victims from the migrant tragedy from two weeks ago. All 53 victims have now been conclusively identified. They were discovered in a tractor trailer on Quintana Road back on June 27th. 
Of the 53 victims, 26 were from Mexico, 21 from Guatemala, and six from Honduras. Officials had to work with their respective countries' consulates to get their identifications. The process to get all the remains returned is now underway. City leaders are prepared to serve the community in today's heat, including if potential rolling outages happen. That was the message at today's press conference with CPS Energy, SAWS, and Via Transit. City and county leaders providing an update on the measures they are taking to reduce the energy load and keep people safe at home. Lisa Barrera has more about the efforts and how one local business is helping others stay cool. Could San Antonio see another round of rolling outages as we reach 106 degrees? On extremely hot days, there's always a chance. It's just so oppressively hot right now um, that you just don't, you know, power plants can come offline because of mechanical issues. In the event of rolling outages, CPS estimates them to last about 15 minutes. What we've done uh, since Winter Storm Uri is those really big circuits where we had that problem last time, we've installed uh, 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 Sw basically switching devices that allow us to take that circuit and break it up. But the more than 20 degree difference between outside and inside temperatures is already causing issues for businesses around San Antonio. Most restaurants have their own ice machine, but because it's so hot outside, their machines don't make as much ice as they normally would, so they call us for supplemental ice. Mireles Party Ice serves thousands of clients throughout the area, but the demand, Mireles says, has increased about 30 percent. We're making about 140 tons of ice a day. That's about seven 18 wheelers worth of ice every day. Well, making ice, that's the easy part of this process. Mirele says it's the tough part is actually helping keep cool for the entire, providing the ice for the entire city of San Antonio. But on top of, on top of worrying about staying cool, people at home are worried how much this is actually going to cost them. And CPS says when it comes to that, there won't be a spike, a price increase when it comes to the heat that we're dealing with today. Reporting live, Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Alicia. Apparently, she found the cool spot in town. Right? I think we right all want to be in there instead of uh, out in the oppressive heat today. Yeah, uh, you know, a walk-in freezer, a walk-in fridge. Oh, that's the sweet spot, the place to be. Now, the latest we've heard from the National Weather Service, high temperature today, 107. That's preliminary. There is the chance it could be bumped up to 108. Either way, it's a record high temperature. The previous record, 104, set back in 1917. The average high, of course, 94. So this marks the 33rd 100-degree day so far this year. There's still a lot of summer to go around. So we are creeping up pretty quickly on the third place position for most all time 100 degree days. Third is 41. That was back in 2013. The most, of course, 59 back in 2009. Look at the high, t high temperatures today across the state. We're all feeling the heat. Triple digits just about everywhere. Abilene up to 105 along with Lubbock. El Paso 99. Meanwhile, 110 the high temperature in Del Rio and Catula. Gonzales 107. A few cooling showers still out there, especially west of San Antonio. Lakey getting in on the action. We're going to take a closer look at some of these showers, how much rain fell and where, and if there's any hope of more rain as temperatures get trimmed back a little bit in the days ahead. We'll talk about it all, let you know what temperatures are going to do in just a bit, Dave. All right, Adam, thank you. Look forward to that. Overcrowding at the Bear County Jail remains an issue for Sheriff Javier Salazar. Currently, of the 5,000 beds available, close to 4,600 are occupied. Erica Hernandez spoke to Sheriff and one district judge who's trying to help with the problem. We haven't even hit our peak time of the year yet, which we know is August, September, uh, and we're already pretty high. Sheriff Javier Salazar is trying to find ways to deal with overcrowding at the Bear County Jail. While some beds remain, staffing the amount of mentally ill inmates in the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic are all still an issue. We've just got to get the system going the way it needs to. And that is why one judge is hoping to help out with this situation. Today, her docket has about 40 inmates, which is 40 cases that she will be going over. Inmates are being shuffled in and out Judge Belia Mesa's 226 district courtroom all day. With no trial scheduled, she focused on cases that could possibly be cleared to help alleviate the jail population problem. If you bring them over and they have a chance to have a face-to-face -face talk with their attorney, um, you, both sides are going to get pushed by me. 
Of the 40 cases in her court today, Judge Mesa was hoping to get them to trial or resolve their plea deals. It takes everyone, the sheriff, so the law enforcement, um, the state, uh, represented by the DA and the judiciary. We all have to work together. The judge's approach is one the sheriff applauds as efforts continue to find a solution to the overcrowding problem. Any judges that, that, that care to do the same or something similar, they have my, my undying support. All they got to do is let me know what it is they need from me to help them help us out. Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. Well, just two days before the execution of Ramiro Gonzalez, a stay of, execu of execution is issued by the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals. Gonzalez has made headlines after asking to give a kidney donation before execution. He's convicted for the shooting death of 18-year-old Bridget Townsend, whose remains were found two years after she vanished in 2001. According to court records, the stay of execution was given because a doctor who testified as a trial expert gave false testimony that could have affected the jury's vote. As of now, it is clear if the, this it is not clear if this will impact the decision to let Gonzalez donate his kidney. More funding coming to San Antonio ready to work program. The city of San Antonio made the announcement today that they received a million dollar grant from the U.S. Department of Labor. San Antonio was one of 30 recipients to get money from an internship, uh, apprenticeship building American grant. The city will get more than $2.9 million. The SA Ready to Work program helps thousands get certificate certifications or degrees in different high quality in demand jobs. It sounds pretty good. Well, the San Antonio River is beautiful to look at. It's one of the things that makes our city so unique. But what you find in the water, yeah, that's not so pretty. No one ever wants to say I'm part of the problem, but we all are. Tonight on KSAT Explains, Justin Horn puts water from the San Antonio River under a microscope and shows what's being done to make the river clean enough to swim in. Recent mass cavalry events are hitting this couple a little harder as it affected both their hometowns. The change they want to see coming up. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at our trans guide here. We're going to be looking at 410 at Fredericksburg. You can see some steady traffic on the road. People hopefully heading home for the day, maybe getting home with, with some fans on to cool off. Mm. AC going in the cars there. We'll be right back after this. We are working on several stories for you tonight on the Night Beat. Questions are mounting after the decision not to release video in response to the school shooting in Uvalde. But a Texas House Committee chairman plans to offer some answers. What the victim's parents are now saying. And you felt today's dangerously high temperatures. Imagine having to live outside in this heat. Tonight we hear from the unsheltered and how outreach groups are planning on helping. Those stories and more tonight on the Night Beats. The Uvalde school massacre happened back on May 24th, less than two months later. The Highland Park July 4th parade mass shooting. Those incidents, the hometowns to a Texas couple with young children who are now grappling with both fear and grief. They opened up to our Courtney Friedman about what they want to see happen next. Elizabeth Murphy is a Longhorn who stayed in Austin to raise her family, but her hometown is Highland Park, Illinois, where a gunman opened fire on a popular 4th of July party. I can't even count how many times I took my kids the last few summers to the same exact spot that was shot up. Like I had breakfast at the place that a window was blown out. I feel like so deeply affected and I wasn't even there. Emotion pushed to the brink. Less than two months before that was the mass shooting at Robb Elementary in Uvalde, just a town over from where Elizabeth's husband, John Murphy, grew up. We have a two-year-old and a, and a one-year-old, so it's Hearing about a school, I think, is different now for me. Their feeling of safety has dissolved and their grief has turned into anger. My mom's best friend's daughter or my, my cousin's nanny, all the people that were, were harmed in this and to know that the police had two interactions with this man, how to take weapons from his house, that he was, he was given a semi-automatic weapon that could do this kind of damage, is, it's infuriating. I get it. I own guns. I love to go hunting. That's okay with me. But what's not okay with me is eight-year-olds getting shot in elementary schools. They want more requirements for all gun owners, safe storage, proficiency, and background checks. We have cars. Cars are dangerous. But 
You can't just get a car. If you want to drive a car, then you're going to have to follow some rules. He challenges those who haven't come to the table to pull up a seat. Now, Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. We're going to go up into Sky 12 this evening. You can see it's it's focused over a fire. We're learning this is on West Pyron. It's a small fire. Still waiting on some information about what led up to this. We can, uh, we can tell you that that street, West Pyron, is located south of 90, just off of Highway 35. So if you're headed south on 35, you might be able to see that smoke from, uh, from the highway because it's not very far off the highway. It's on the <coughs> east side of 35. So we'll keep an eye on it and give you any updates as they become available. Exactly, and fire probably not helping Ooh, for firefighters no, out there who have to afternoon. respond in this high heat that we're having. So Again. yeah, I was, I was gonna ask uh, our scientists over there, if you had a 10 pound bag of ice, cause you know, Lisi was in the, in the ice manufacturing plant and you took it outside at 107 degrees, how long would, you, would it take for you to get 10 pounds of water? Is it in the shade or is it in direct sunlight? Oh, see, I knew That's what makes the big difference yeah, right there. there. A question. That would make a there. huge <laughs> difference. I mean, the difference of several minutes easily for sure. But <laughs> it's science. It's science. It's a good <laughs> experiment to do. I do want to tell you, so we got the update from the National Weather Service. Officially today, 107 degrees, which is a record for the high, record high for the day by three degrees. But it ties the all time hottest July temperature on record. 107. That's the hottest we've ever seen in July. And the last time we did that was July 13th back in 2020. Not quite as hot in the days ahead, but of course still above average and you'll feel it out there. A few shower zone. We're actually going to start with that. Let's talk about some good news here. Just like the past couple of days and yet, especially yesterday, a few showers popping up on the radar screen. No, not everybody's getting it. And this will be the case pretty much every day the rest of this week. But at least a few lucky folks have have cashed in on some rain. Most recently, and right now, Rial County going southward into Uvalde County, and even, you know, basically between Lakey, Utopia, and Tarpley, a little bit of action. And this is all drifting southward, very brief, and all of this is going to come to an end as the sun sets. But you look at these rainfall totals, I mean, this is in a rural part of Rial County, but for Ranches, pastures out here, 1.7 inches, estimated by the Doppler radar. That's just a few miles east of the city of Lakey. And everywhere you see colors on this map, that's where we got rain today, all of it north of San Antonio. But Cordillera Ranch area, basically Bergheim to Bernie, right along 46 and just north of 46, over an inch estimated by Doppler radar. And I did see on social media a report of a little bit of tree damage in one part of Cordillera Ranch. There could have been a brief little microburst, a puff of wind downward that then hits the ground and spreads out. And that could have happened. There was no tornado or anything as that uh, post reported. But as we look ahead for rain chances, just 10 to 20% the rest of this week, every afternoon, it's going to be more of the same. A few random hit or miss pop up showers. And I think odds mostly favor locations in the hill country. A little extra elevation and terrain circulations helps out the thermodynamic parameters a bit more to get those going. Right now we're at 104. Dew point is 62. Feels like 106. Hondo, Pleasanton, 108, Kerrville, 95. We actually had some rain in parts of Kerr County, uh, giving some a brief cooling in parts of Kerr County. Eagle Pass at 106, Del Rio, 108. This is important because Del Rio hit 110, and that was a record for the day in Del Rio. Divine takes the cake at 113, Gonzalez at 105. Uh, sometimes I question this divine reading. It's often a little bit higher than surrounding ones. Nonetheless, that's what it's reading right now. You look at the heat index, and this is the feels like temperature. It's just a few degrees higher than the actual air temperature. Humidity drops off in the afternoon, and in turn, it's only about one to two degrees higher than the actual air temperature when you factor in the humidity. And that's going to be the case the next few days. Tomorrow, 104 feels like 106. When Wednesday 103 feels like 105 and that's just for a few hours in the afternoon and then notice by Thursday we could actually be down under 100 for the first time this July. That would be the first time we've been sub 100 for a high temperature. We'll see if it actually pans out. Stray shower mainly west of town through sunset. Otherwise clearing out temperatures still on the warm side. Mid 90s at 10 o'clock midnight 89 degrees and here's your case at 12 hour forecast 7 a.m. tomorrow sunny and 80 degrees by 10 a.m. We're already up to 87. We get to noon 
96. If you work outside, it's going to be more of the same, right around 104 for the high temperature, feeling like it's closer to 106. Uh, Divine 105, Floresville 104, Bulverde, Bernie about 100 tomorrow. So yeah, the heat's still on. Rain chances, as I talked about earlier, not that great, but a few lucky folks, especially in the hill country, could get a few afternoon showers here and there. You said below 100 and David and I started dancing over Ooh. here. <laughs> Excited about that. Thanks, Adam. <laughs> It's always nice to introduce these young Spur fans to a little Spurs tradition. Yeah, we're talking about the Iceman who wore the original uniform when he played for the Spurs way back in the 70s and the 80s. When we come back, Ice says he is cool with this. Check it out. Yeah, that's a classic for their 50th anniversary celebration. More about that new uniform when we come back. And new details on the DeJounte Murray trade reveal coming up. The Spurs unveiling their NBA Nike Classic uniforms for their 50th anniversary this coming season. If it looks familiar, it should because the man making the reveal today wore it proudly when he suited up for the silver and black. The Iceman George Gervin, a Hall of Famer showing off the classic black with San Antonio written across the top, just like the old road uniforms used to say. It's a way to honor the legacy of all the players who've been under the Spurs umbrella. And remember, back then, it was also part of selling the city through the Spurs as a destination or tourist stop. For me and y'all now, you know, excuse me for, you know, the new era, but this has always been my favorite, you know, the San Antonio, you know, with this uh, black jersey. I really loved it and so proud of, to be a part of it coming back. Um, I want to thank the Spurs for that. Uh, this is special. It sure is. These uniforms will be worn by the Spurs players at select games on the road and at home this coming season. Look who's attending the Spurs Summer League games in Las Vegas. Former star point guard and four-time NBA champion Tony Parker. Parker retired from the NBA in 2019 after just one season with the Charlotte Hornets. Before that, 18 seasons with the Spurs before he was replaced by DeJounte Murray in the middle of his last season in silver and black. And now DeJounte just got traded to the Atlanta Hawks. Tony was asked what retirement is like for him. Body feels great. That's the best thing about retirement. <laughs> Nothing hurts now. I love it. I can get out of the bed and I can walk and I don't feel anything. I'm like, man, it feels good. We just won a championship again in France. So we did the three-peat. So the third team in history uh, to do that. So I was happy, very happy because I'm doing this uh, with my brother. He's the yes. head coach who's the assistant coach for the Bucks. So I, I'm not really happy about that, but I'll let it slide. You know that he's with the Bucks. You know, at least he's in the NBA. So that's good. <laughs> he's with Coach Bud. So it's okay. Yeah, so Bud was with the Spurs. Now, look who also made it out to Las Vegas for the Summer League Games, Parker's replacement, DeJounte Murray. This is his first interview since being introduced in Atlanta as a member of the Hawks following that blockbuster trade that brought the Spurs three first-round draft picks. DeJounte getting a little more insight on in how the trade went down and was he was shocked when it happened. My reaction was just, uh, it was something me, me and Pop already talked about, so... It wasn't really no big reaction because before it was done, I already knew what it was and, you know, Pop knew what it was because that was our conversation, uh, you know, but at the end of the day, you know, we all understand the business and, you know, for me, I try to keep the same motto for me every day, you know, work hard and control what I control and, uh, you know, I happen to be an Atlanta Hawk and I'm just excited. All right, the Spurs playing back-to-back -back games. They lost last night, taking on the Rockets today, and they're up right now 20-19. to Former Spur for about a week, Danilo Gallinari has signed with the Boston Celtics for two years, $13.1 million. You remember Gallinari came to the Spurs on June the 30th as part of the blockbuster trade with Atlanta for DeJounte Murray. The Spurs asked him to accept a delay in his buyout until this past Friday. So instead of costing the Spurs $5 million to buy out his $21.5 million last year of his contract, the Spurs had to pay him $13 million. So he made out pretty well in just one week. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Congratulations to former Secretary of State and National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice, who just became part of the new ownership group of the Denver Broncos. That's after Walmart heir Rob Walton and his daughter purchased the team for $4.65 billion. And of course, coming up tonight on the Night Beat, highlights of the Spurs Summer League game, hopefully a victory. Well, that'd be nice. They could use one. Yes, they could. All right, Greg. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Is it possible to swim in the San Antonio River? That's just one of the many questions we go to answer in our latest episode of KSAT Explains. Hear the answer in our next half hour.
Firefighters are busy this afternoon. This is another live look with Sky 12. This time we're over a different site, this fire, and you can see it is a huge fire. This is on the east side of San Antonio. Yeah, lots of billowing smoke there. You can see the firefighters responding with water. This is over Eddy Road near Loop 410 and Highway 90 Exchange. Looks like it happened at a yard full of wooden pallets there. And if that's the case, that means this thing could be burning for a while. And you know with that heat, it's going to be tough on those firefighters. We'll keep an eye on this for you and we'll uh, update you as more information becomes available. It has devastated our city, but also brought prosperity. And at the end of the day, it's why San Antonio even exists. If you think about it, the San Antonio River defines our community. But at the same time, not one of us would willingly jump into the waterway we all value so much. That's because we have a pretty good idea of what's in there, and it's not pretty. For this case, that explains Justin Horn takes us inside a lab to explore just how polluted the river is and answers the question, Will we ever be able to swim in the San Antonio River? We have a trash problem. You might say that step one is admitting you have a problem, but we've known about our trash issue for years. Change takes time. And that trash isn't being done by me or you, it's all of us. No one ever wants to say I'm part of the problem, but we all are. That's true, but it's not just trash that makes the San Antonio River a lesson in biochemistry. And to understand it better, let's float our way back to the beginning. This is the historic source of the water that feeds to the river. In the middle of the University of Incarnate Word, the Blue Hole stands as an icon of San Antonio history. After all, this is likely where civilization began in the area. It was a prolific spring. And you'll actually get this blue, um, iridescent kind of water flowing out of here. It's really magical. Magical, yes, but only on rare occasions. These days, it's mostly dried up. You gotta have an aquifer level of 672 feet or more for this to flow. So then the question becomes, where does the water in the San Antonio River that we see around the Riverwalk, where does it come from? For many years, it came from wells, but then we realized the aquifer needed protecting. So for the last 20 years, the primary source of the Riverwalk water and the water going downstream has been reclaimed water. Now that can all change when it rains. We get a lot of rainwater in. These springs do flow every couple years as well. But it, it, predominantly, when you're on the Riverwalk having a margarita, that's reclaimed water for the most part and the zoo well making up most of the flow of the river. A fluid water, as it's called, can make up as much as 90% of the water in the river. And while it comes from things like sewer plants, it happens to be very clean. when we place it under the uh, UV lamp. If it fluoresces brighter than that, then it will be positive for E. coli. So then why, when tested in the San Antonio River Authority lab, is the water from the river glowing? No, it's not radioactive, but tests which are done here often glow when E. coli is present. You've probably heard of this rather unfriendly bacteria which can have bad results for you and I if ingested. And that E. coli gets in our river from, well, you've probably guessed by now, the polite term is excrement. If you're not picking up after your pet, then that the excrements are being flushed into the river and that's the source of E. coli. It's not just Fido's fault though. Animals of all kind contribute, including feral hogs who use the river as their personal restroom. And ducks, that's why they tell you not to feed the ducks. And how do we know that? This machine in the River Authority lab can break down whose gut that E. coli came from. So, circling back to the whole swimming thing. The reason why there's more of the concern as far as pollutants go is because there are uh, elevated levels of bacteria, mostly E. coli bacteria, in largely in downtown San Antonio. And this is an important point. While you can't swim in the river in San Antonio, that's not necessarily the case farther downstream. The water quality does get better as you go downstream, as you get away from urban city centers. One of the biggest reasons is, is stormwater runoff. You have the accumulation on streets, on sidewalks, on lawns, uh, parks. Yes, while rainfall is a good thing in most cases, it's not good, however, when it comes to water quality. It helps to wash all of San Antonio's nastiness into the river. We can actually have pretty good water quality in these long drought periods, but the minute it rains, 
the water quality goes horrible. Now that we know what's in it, what happens, and we've all thought about it, if you're walking along the river walk, you trip and fall in. You should stand up, it's pretty shallow. Right, but are we going to get sick? You're not gonna get sick, um, you know, if you jump in the river and you take a few gulps of water, things might not be as good, but you're not gonna get sick just from falling in the river walk. Then what about the species that call the river home? You've likely seen someone fishing in the river. Are the fish safe to eat? It's completely safe to eat fish in our system. The only exception is there is a about a 15 or 20 mile stretch of Leon Creek that does have an impairment for edible fish tissue. So meaning you should not eat fish out of the lower portions of the Leon Creek. But every other water body in our basin is, is considered safe for consuming fish. These water quality issues, by the way, are not just a San Antonio problem. We're certainly not alone in, in the, the urban, urban water quality issues. It is something that every single major city in the country deals with. And the good news? San Antonio is headed in the right direction. You talk to some people who have, you know, horror stories from 30, 40, 50 years ago about what the river was and where we are now is is, is light years beyond what, what it was, again, many, many years ago. Much of that thanks to moves taken by the community and the San Antonio River Authority, including inside their lab here where water testing occurs daily. The functions of the lab are, are critical because they really tell you are all the other actions and decisions you're making and actions you're taking, are they impacting the river in a meaningful way? Actions like the habitat restoration along the Mission Reach and the River Authority's new campaign, Don't Let Litter Trash Your River. A recent report card from the River Authority overall gave the San Antonio River a B, but it did receive an F for flood insurance coverage and public trash. Awareness leads to action, action leads to advocacy, where someday, None of us would ever, ever think to throw something on the street because we know that street will go to a curb inlet, that curb inlet to a pipe, and that trash will make its way eventually to some creek or tributary that goes to the San Antonio River. Meaning someday, just maybe more of the San Antonio River will be swimmable. I'm an optimist, so uh, you know I, I hope that there's something in the near future. We often are at recreational standards that absolutely would allow you to go canoeing and kayaking, what we call secondary recreation. But the primary, when you swim, you put your head underwater, we're not there yet, but we do have a dream. That's sort of our big dream is where and how can we make the river more swimmable. Lots of knowledge about our river right there. For more episodes like this one, scan the QR code on your screen. You see it right now. It'll take you directly to the KSAT Explains page on KSAT.com. So just enjoy the beauty that is from the sidewalk. Exactly. When you're downtown. There you go. Sequoia trees at risk as the wildfire Yosemite National Park doubles in size. What crews on the ground are doing to stop the flames. An unexpected testimony is expected tomorrow on Capitol Hill in the January 6 hearings. Why former White House strategist Steve Bannon is allowed to testify. Well, on Capitol Hill, former White House strategist Steve Bannon is now willing to testify. Well, we'll get to that story in just a moment. We're taking another live look outside. This is back on that fire on Eddy Road. You can see fire crews still responding there. The smoke dying down just a bit from what we saw a few minutes ago. We're still waiting for further information on that fire. We understand a lot of pallets, wooden pallets are on fire over there. And on Capitol Hill, former White House strategist Steve Bannon is now willing to testify before the January 6th House Select Committee. Bannon claimed former President Trump's invoking executive privilege kept him from testifying, but now has says Trump has released him from that order, but an attorney for Trump told the Department of Justice that former president never claimed executive privilege for Bannon. The seventh public hearing will be tomorrow. Meanwhile, roughly 800 people now face charges at the Capitol insurrection. About a third had previous ties to an extremist group. The Washburn fire at Yosemite Park in California threatening a national treasure, the giant sequoias. The fire now entering a grove home to more than 500 giant sequoias. The Washburn fire doubled in size over the weekend to more than 2,300 acres. While they've avoided major damage so far, fire crews have installed a sprinkler system to dampen the ground around the park. Residents and visitors now dealing with unhealthy air quality throughout the Yosemite Valley. We'll be right back. 
We were talking at noon today, and I told Justin, I said it felt like I was taking a nap here in San Antonio and ended up waking up in Phoenix or something. Yeah, it's just <laughs> it's like, miserably hot. Like, what happened? No idea. This is not normal. Well, you're, yes, and one factor here is the, the, well, the fact that we're in drought, that dry ground really helps the temperatures climb so much and drought begets drought. So unfortunately, it just compounds the situation and makes it worse. All right, take a look at this 107. The high temperature today that ties for fifth place of the all time hottest temperatures ever recorded in San Antonio and ties for the hottest July temperature ever recorded. So yes, a historic day, not just the record high for the day, but also the hottest reading in July tied for the same uh, back in 2020 and the fifth hottest all time. So our temperature trend 104 tomorrow. That would be another record by one degree 103 on Wednesday. And then we may just may dip below 100 by a degree or so on Thursday. It's that psychological factor. You're not going to notice a huge difference, but that also would be the only day so far this month where we've been sub 100. So Thursday is the day to focus on and we'll see if that verifies. All right, take a look at our live cam. We've got some clouds out there. This is leftover cloud cover from some of the showers and storms that were north of San Antonio. So we're looking northbound uh, from 410 right here on the north side of town. 104 degrees, dew point is 62. No breeze out there. That's one of the issues. And we have a you know group chat with our uh, weather team and we were all saying you know yesterday and the day before, it's one thing when you have a breeze and you have the heat, but we just don't have much of a breeze out there and we haven't and it's going to be fairly limited the next few days as well. When you factor in the humidity it feels like 106, so it feels like it's two degrees warmer than the actual air temperature. Catula right now actual measurement of 110. Gonzales 104 mid 90s through most of the hill country. You get to Rock Springs, though, 99 degrees. Helotus 100 Rio Medina 105 105 New Braunfels Canyon Lake 92 Bulverde 96. Parts of Comal County actually had some cooling showers earlier today and you factor in the humidity. And as I said before, it feels like a few degrees warmer than the actual air temperature for most of us. And that's going to be the trend going forward. So tomorrow 104, but feels like 106 for just a few hours in the afternoon. Wednesday 103 feels like 105. So tack on a few degrees to that backyard thermometer temperature in order to give you the uh, calculated feels like basically and by Thursday. OK, there we go. That's our hope. 90 for the high, but it would still feel like it's 102. And then into the weekend, we see those temperatures uh, back up into the low 100s. Here's a look at live radar out there just south of Lakey, west and east of Concan, a little bit of activity and moving into Canipa right now, the outflow boundary. So along Highway 90, those of you Valley, Canipa and towards Sabinaw, you're going to have this little outflow boundary. That'll be a brief, nice breeze of slightly cooler air. Now what we could use right now is a tropical system. You know, a tropical storm, a weak tropical storm to move in. Give us a bunch of tropical moisture, the big fat raindrops we need and we'd like to see. There is the potential of a little bit of development in the northern Gulf over the next five days, about a 30, 20 to 30 percent chance with that. Even if it does develop into, say, a tropical depression, I think the upper level heat high is too strong and will kind of stiff arm it and keep it away from us. So 10 to 20 percent chance chances the next few afternoons. And that's about it. Warm and humid this evening, increasing humidity. Actually, later on tonight, 10 o'clock, 95 degrees near 90 at midnight, 80 degrees at 7 a.m. tomorrow by noon. We're already in the mid 90s at 96. And then just that slight chance, that 10 percent chance of a stray shower tomorrow and not much of a breeze yet again, but our rain chances not looking that good the rest of this week. At least a few lucky neighborhoods will get a few afternoon showers. I'm pulling for some of the big fat tropical raindrops. Well, you've had some at your house, haven't you lately? I got lucky. Yes. Yeah, you did. Not lucky at my house. Not yet. Not yet. We'll be right back in case you missed it. Coming up next. It is Monday, it is July 11th. 
This morning, Uvalde County Sheriff David Nolasco made his way to Austin to testify behind closed doors, and his testimony comes after a deposition was issued last week. The chair for the state committee says they now have nearly 40 interviews and they hope to release their preliminary report within days, and they wanted to include hallway surveillance video from Robb Elementary, and we're expected to release that today. However, it appears the video may not be released publicly anytime soon, and that's apparently a directive issued by Uvalde District Attorney Christina Mitchell Busby. First Lady Dr. Jill Biden is headed to Antonio today for a Latinx inclusion luncheon. The First Lady arrived at Joint Base San Antonio Lackland around noon today. Her visit was at the Grand Hyatt downtown and was a part of the Unidos U.S. Annual Conference. It was an annual event for people to collaborate on issues that include housing, health, racial equity, education, diversity and inclusion. The fire inside Yosemite National Park continues to burn and it has now grown to over 2,000 acres. A growing fire has posed a threat to ancient trees known as giant sequoia trees in Yosemite. The park says it thinks mitigation efforts will protect the trees from major damage and the flames are also leading to other concerns though. Today the smoke could worsen air quality in the Bay Area. Scott Arnold, a mailman who received a special honor from his community. Scott has been delivering mail for the U.S. Postal Service to 400 houses in the same Virginia neighborhood for 40 years. When I turn the corner and there's like 125 people standing out in the middle of the road, it was like I've never had a rush like that in my life.